Section 35 The French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Hilaire Belloc. Section 35. Chapter 6. Continued. The Revolution and the Catholic Church. The men of the National Assembly would have acted more wisely had they closely studied the story of Ireland, then but little known, or had they even made themselves acquainted with the methods by which the Catholic Church in Britain, after passing in the fifteenth century through a phase somewhat similar to that under which it was sinking into Gaul in the eighteenth, was still under Henry and Elizabeth. But the desire of the men of 1789 was not to kill the Church but to let it die. They thought it dying. Their desire was only to make that death decent and of no hurt to the nation, and to control the political action of a hierarchy that had been wealthy and was bound up with the old society that was crumbling upon every side. The civil constitution of the clergy failed. It lit the civil war. It dug the pit which divided Catholicism from the revolution, at the moment of the foreign invasion. It segregated the loyal priest in such a fashion that his order could not but appear to the populace as an order of traitors, and it led in the furnace of 1793 to the great persecution from the memories of which the relations between the French democracy and the Church have not recovered. It is important to trace the actual steps of the failure, for when we appreciate what the dates were, how short the time which was left for judgment or for revision, and how immediately disaster followed upon error, we can understand what followed, and we can understand it in no other way. If we find an enduring quarrel between two families whose cause of contention we cannot seize, and whose mutual hostility we find unreasonable, to learn that it proceeded from a cataclysm too rapid and too violent for either to have exercised judgment upon it, will enable us to excuse or at least to comprehend the endurances of their antagonism. Now it was a cataclysm which fell upon the relations of the Church and the State immediately after the error which the Parliament had committed, a cataclysm quite out of proportion to their intentions, as indeed are most sudden disasters, quite out of proportion to the forces that bring them about. It was, as we have seen in the summer of 1790, upon the 12th of July, that the civil constitution of the clergy was approved by the assembly. But it was not until the 26th of August that the king consented to sign, nor was there at the moment any attempt to give the law effect. The protests of the bishops, for instance, came out quite at leisure in the month of October, and the active principle of the whole of the civil constitution, to wit, the presentation of the civic oath, which the clergy were required to take, was not even debated until the end of the year. This civic oath, which is sometimes used as the bugbear in the matter, was no more than an engagement under the sanction of an oath that the bishop or priest taking it would maintain the new regime, though that regime included the constitution of the clergy. The oath involved no direct breach with Catholic doctrine or practice, it was indeed a folly to impose it, and it was folly based upon the ignorance of the politicians and of many of the bishops of the day as to the nature of the Catholic Church. But the oath was not, nor was it intended to be, a measure of persecution. Many of the parish clergy took it, and most of them probably took it in good faith. Nor did it discredit the oath with the public that was refused by all save four of the acting bishops for the condition of the hierarchy in pre-revolutionary France was notorious. The action of the bishops appeared in the public eye to be purely political, and the ready acceptance of the oath by so many, though a minority of the lower clergy, argued strongly in its favor. Nevertheless, no Catholic priest or bishop or layman could take that oath without landing himself in disloyalty to his religion and that for the same reason which led St. Thomas of Canterbury to make his curious and fruitful stand against the reasonable 
and inevitable as much as against the unreasonable governmental provisions of his time the catholic church as an institution of necessity autonomous it cannot admit the right of any other power exterior to its own organization to impose upon it a modification of its discipline nor above all a new conception of its hierarchic organization the reader must carefully distinguish between the acceptation by the church of a detail of economic reform the consent to suppress a corporation at the request of a civil power or even to forego certain traditional political rights and the admission of the general principle of civil control to that general principle the assembly in framing the constitution of the clergy was quite evidently committed to admit such a coordinated external and civic power or rather to admit a superior external power is in theory to deny the principle of catholicism and in practice to make of the catholic church what the other state religions of christendom have become i have said that not until the end of the year seventeen ninety was the debate opened upon the proposition to compel the clergy to take the oath it is a singular commentary upon the whole affair that compulsion should have been the subject for debate at all it should have followed one would have imagined normally from the law but so exceptional had been the action of the assembly and as they were now beginning to find so perilous that a special decree was necessary and the king's signature to it before this normal consequence of a measure which had been law for months could be acted upon here let the reader pause and consider with what that moment the end of seventeen ninety coincided the assignates paper money issued upon the security of the confiscated estates of the church had already depreciated ten per cent those who had first accepted them were paying throughout france a penny in the livre or as we may put it a penny farthing on the shilling for what must have seemed to most of them the obstinacy of one single corporation and that an unpopular one against the decrees of the national assembly it was now the moment when a definite reaction against the revolution was first taking shape and when the populace was first beginning uneasily to have suspicion of it it was the moment when the court was beginning to negotiate for flight it was the moment when though the populace did not know it mirabeau was advising the king with all his might to seize upon the enforcement of the priest's oath as an opportunity for civil war the whole air of that winter was charged with doubt and mystery in the minds of all who had enthusiastically followed the march of the revolution the short days of that rigorous cold of seventeen ninety to ninety one contained passages of despair and a very brief period was to suffice for making the clerical oath not only the test of democracy against reaction but the wedge that should split the nation in two with the very opening of the new year on the fourth of january the bishops and priests in the assembly were summoned to take the oath to the king the nation and the law but that law included the civil constitution of the clergy and they refused within three months mirabeau was dead the flight of the king determined on the suspicion of paris at white heat the oath taken or refused throughout france and the schismatic priests introduced into their parishes it may be imagined with what a clamour and with how many village quarrels in that same fortnight appeared the papal brief long delayed and known as the brief caritas denouncing the civil constitution of the clergy six weeks later at the end of may the papal representative at the french court was withdrawn and in that act religious war declared throughout this quarrel which was now exactly of a year's duration but the acute phase of which had lasted only six months every act of either party to it necessarily tended to make the conflict more violent not only was there no opportunity for conciliation but in the very nature of things the most moderate council had to range itself on one side or the other and every public act which touched in any way upon the sore point though it touched but indirectly 
and with no desire on the part of the actors to rouse the passions of the moment, immediately appeared as a provocation upon one side or the other. It was inevitable that it should be so, with a population which had abandoned the practice of religion, with the attachment of the clerical organization to the organization of the old regime, with the strict bond of discipline that united the priesthood of the church in France into one whole, and, above all, with the necessity under which the revolution was, at this stage, of finding a definite and tangible enemy. This last point is of the very first importance. Public opinion was exasperated and inflamed, for the king was known to be an opponent of the democratic movement. Yet he signed the bills and could not be overtly attacked. The queen was known to be a violent opponent of it, but she did not actually govern. The governments of Europe were known to be opponents, but no diplomatic note had yet appeared of which public opinion could make an object for an attack. The resistance therefore offered by the clergy to the civil constitution had just that effect which a nucleus will have in the crystallization of some solution. It polarized the energies of the revolution. It provided a definite foil, a definite negative, a definite counterpoint, a definite but. Here was a simple issue. Men wearing a special uniform, pursuing known functions, performing a known part in society, to wit the priests, were now for the most part the enemies of the new democratic constitution that was in preparation. They would not take the oath of loyalty to it. They were everywhere in secret rebellion against it, and where they were dispossessed of their cures, in open rebellion. The clergy, therefore, that is, the non-juring clergy, and the conforming clergy were an experiment that soon became a fiction, were after April 1791, in the eyes of all the Democrats of the time, the plainest and most tangible form of the opposition to democracy. The End of Section 35